Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that indeed we can draw near to you and most importantly have a relationship with you because of Jesus, our great high priest and source of all hope. Thank you that as we have just sung, Jesus is interceding for us by pouring out your grace on our lives day by day. We pray now that as we turn to your word, Holy Spirit, that you will give us open ears and receptive hearts to hear you, the living God, speak to us and enable us to respond to you in repentance and faith. And we pray this in the strong and mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ and God's people. <coughs> Amen. Very warm good morning to you, friends, on my behalf. And as always, a great joy to be with you as we come together around God's Word and as we hear the Lord, the Creator of heaven and earth, address us this morning. And can I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we continue working our way through our series of Hebrews, which we have called A Better Jesus. A Better Jesus. And this morning we come to week number nine in our series of this wonderful letter. And I thought it would just be very helpful for a moment to refresh our memories as to why exactly this letter was written. Because most importantly, we want to apply the truth of God's Word into our own hearts and lives. So the author of Hebrews writes this letter to encourage his readers who have made a good start in their relationship with Jesus to continue holding fast to Him. And the reason for this was because of the persecution they were encountering. And as a result, the temptation for these Jewish Christians was to go back to their old way of life in Judaism. And I would like to read to you, and the words will be on the screen behind me, just to remind us the, let, the reason for this letter being written. It's from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 to 35. The author writes, But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plunging of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. So in the light of their suffering, the author urges his readers not to give up on the Lord Jesus. Don't give up on Jesus, because Jesus is so much better than the Old Testament. Jesus was better than the angels. He was better than Moses. He was better than the temple and the sacrificial system. And he was even better than the Old Testament priesthood, which lies at the heart to this very chapter and will continue throughout the letter of Hebrews. Now I'm not too sure what comes to your mind when you think of the word priest. But I just want you to think about it for a second. But no doubt, if I to ask you right now, there would be a variety of different answers, ranging from a man wearing a plain shirt with a clerical collar, or as the clergy refer to it, as a dog collar. Perhaps you think of it as a man wearing a robe with all its garb and with all its bells and whistles. And this kind of strange man, he performs all kinds of rituals, traditions, and he even marries people and conducts funerals. Well, who better that comes to our mind than the man on the screen behind me? Do you recognize him? Rowan Atkinson, or better known as Mr. Bean. Does he look good? I trust and pray by God's grace I'll never look like that in the future. <laughs> but there's Mr. B or Rowan Atkinson from the scene or the movie Four Weddings and 
the funeral. In our world today, this is how many people think of a priest. But how we think of a priest is very different to how the Bible portrays the priesthood, particularly in the Old Testament, and what the priesthood meant to the original readers or hearers. Now I'm not too sure if you found the reading of Hebrews chapter 7 a bit overwhelming. Yes, did I hear a yes? But chapter 7 is foundational to our understanding of the priesthood in the Old Testament. And more importantly, how Melchizedek points us to Jesus. Because Jesus is a better priest. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament priesthood. And that is what I'd like to share with you this morning as we look at Jesus, a better priest. Now in Hebrew, the name means Melech, which is where we get the word king. And the word for righteousness is Telek. That is spelled T-S-E-D-E-Q. That is where we get the word righteousness. But the author also tells us something even more profound, where he's not only a king and the king of righteousness, but according to the author, he is also the king of peace. So what we see in these opening verses is that the author wants to highlight and bring to our attention the greatness of Melchizedek. And how the author does this is that he does it by explaining the events that took place that are recorded for us in Genesis chapter 14, where we are introduced for the very first time to this priest, Melchizedek. When he met Abraham, after Abraham rescued his nephew Lot, after being carried off by foreign armies. And although we read it earlier from the Old Testament, I want to reread verses 17 to 20 again of Genesis 14. And my purpose in doing so is to show you the importance of these verses. So if you have your Bibles open, go back to Genesis chapter 14. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba. That is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God, most high. Now look carefully at verses 19 and 20, friends. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God, most high. Possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. It's absolutely amazing. But you might be thinking to yourself, what's so significant about this, Andrew? What's the big deal? Well, I want you to think about it for a moment, friends. In the Old Testament, who could be greater than Abraham? After all, Abraham was the founding father of the Jewish faith. He was the man who God made those three promises of land, descendants, and blessing. And through Abraham, the whole world would be blessed. So I wonder if you notice what the author is saying. What he is saying is that someone greater than Abraham is here. And instead of, fi instead of finding blessing through Abraham, Abraham now is the one being blessed. So what does he do? Look at verse 2. Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything he had. Now I'm going to explain this in a little more detail shortly. But what we have noticed so far is that he is the king of righteousness and he is the king of peace. But it's also important to notice that phrase, he is the king of Salem. It's simply just another word for Jerusalem. You see, one can't help but notice how Melchizedek, who was greater than Abraham, was a foreshadowing of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our true source of righteousness and our true source 
of all peace. Now in this day and age, let's face it friends, we can't do without our cell phones. Yes, you would all agree with me. We can't do without our tablets or our iPhones or our iPads. And the reality is friends, no matter what kind of gadget you have, they all have these wonderful built-in cameras now. And so it's very difficult to live without our modern technological gadgets. And of course, particularly when it comes to cell phones, we love taking them on holidays. We do so for a number of reasons. One, for security. Two, to be in contact with our loved ones. And three, just to be checking what's up on Facebook or Instagram. But when we go on holiday, we take our cell phones so we can take as many photos as possible. And we do that so after our holiday is finished, we can look and reflect on the wonderful photos that we took, and even more importantly, the wonderful holiday that we had. The photos are simply a mirror to reflect that real holiday that you had in Mauritius or the Seychelles. <laughs> but you see, in a similar way, Melchizedek is a mirror or type of Christ. And Melchizedek is pointing us forward to Jesus. Because the titles given to Melchizedek, friends, were simply attributes. Only Jesus could perfectly fulfill his titles. The King of Righteousness and the King of Peace. And if you are sitting here this morning, friends, and you are a Christian, and you have assurance in your own heart and life that you are a child of the living God, then the great news is, is that God no longer sees you as a guilty, condemned sinner. Because God now sees you as a child of the living God. A son or daughter of our Creator. And when He sees you, He has clothed you with the righteousness of Christ. And He sees you, friends, as though you had never sinned. So when God looks at you, He looks at you with the perfection of Christ. And here is the wonderful message of the Gospel, friends, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners such as you and me. And more importantly, to give us peace with God. This is why the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, says these most profound words. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe worth pausing and reflecting, friends, at this point, and asking yourself, do you truly understand of what it means to be at peace with God? I'm not asking you if you know about the peace of God. There is a fundamental difference. As you sit here this morning, are you trusting in the finished work of Christ upon the cross? Are you trusting in the righteousness of Jesus? And you might be thinking to yourself, yes, Andrew, I am. So what difference does it make? But she has something worth reflecting upon. Could it be like those first century Jewish Christians to whom the author was writing that you are tempted in the same way to go back to your former way of life? Where you are relying on your tradition or you are relying on some kind of ritual to make you right with God. Maybe you think that being a Christian is all about coming to church and attending a midweek Bible study, which it is. But the Christian life is far more involved than that. It is about having a personal relationship with Jesus. 
You see, there's a very important lesson this morning that we can learn by way of application. And the lesson is this, that if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, do not ever, ever give up on Jesus. Stop relying on your tradition. Stop relying on your rituals. Stop relying on your religion to make you right with God. And that you think that you come to church today and you've done God a favor. As if God needs me. God doesn't need you, friends. He doesn't need any of us. You see, the moment we turn back, our, the moment we do this, what we are doing is that we are turning our backs on Jesus. And it will be extremely foolish, foolish of us to think that it can never ever happen to us. Remember what happened to God's people, the nation of Israel, when they turned their backs on God. They faced His judgment. And if God's people could face His judgment, then what makes you think that even as believers in Christ, we are never going to be held accountable to the Lord? That is why in Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths explaining to us, because of what Jesus has done for us through His death and resurrection, we are now the new people of God. And now as the transformed new community of God's people, we ought to have our minds renewed and transformed by the power of God's Word. So here is McKillardick, where he's not only pointing us forward to Jesus in terms of his righteousness and his kingship, but did you notice what else the author tells us? He tells us McKillardick had no father or mother. In other words, he was without genealogy. And you think to yourself, wow, that is phenomenal. So what does all this mean? You see, in the Old Testament, unlike the Levit Levitical priests, who had to trace their genealogy all the way back to Aaron, and the priests served a limited time in the office of being a priest. When it came to Melchizedek, there was no genealogy. And so as one writer helpfully tells us about this verse, he summarizes it by saying the following, Melchizedek's sudden appearance from recorded history awakens within a sensitive reader the notion of eternity. What was foreshadowed in Melchizedek's having no beginning or end was fully realized in Christ's eternal priesthood. So not only is Melchizedek's greatness seen in that he was the king of righteousness, the king of peace, and that he had no genealogy, but his greatness was also seen and how he received Abraham's tithes and blessing, which we saw earlier on in verse 2. So the point of these verses is that the author wants to bring to our attention that Abraham was standing in the presence of someone far superior and greater than him. So look at verses 5 and 6 of chapter 7. The author writes, And those descendants of Levi, who receive the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Don't you love verse 6? Did you notice that transition with that one word, but? So the author is showing us how Melchizedek was far greater than Abraham. But 
more so that Jesus' priesthood was far superior because the old Aaronic priesthood in the Old Testament, dear friends, it was insufficient. That the old covenant was never able to bring perfection to the people. And we see this secondly in verses 11 through to 19. That the old Aaronic priesthood could never bring peace in their relationship with God. <laughs> Look at verse 11. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? So the key word here in this passage is perfection. Perfection. And in our minds, whenever we think of the word perfection, we think along the lines of maturity or completeness. But I want us to understand, friends, that there's a far more deeper and significant meaning behind this. Because the word perfection actually means to come before or to stand in the presence of God. Just think about that for a second. To stand in the presence of God. In other words, to have access to Him and to live in a right relationship with Him. It is to be in a right relationship with God, our Creator. Because of the whole priesthood system in the Old Testament, or even the law itself, was unable to achieve this. Now this does not need to say that the law was useless, because the law had been instituted by God. But the point is this, the priest and even the law could never ever atone for the people's sins. All the sacrificial system could accomplish was simply to cover over the people's sins. But it never really fully dealt with the people's sin. Why? Because the animals couldn't remove the people's sins. And the sacrificial system in the Old Testament was repeated year in and year out. Year in and year out. And even the author of Hebrews later on in chapter 10 says this, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats never to take away the sins. This was why the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament was one of the most important days in the life of the nation of Israel. Where once a year only the high priest could enter into the inner chamber of the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sin offerings. And after he had performed the sacrifice, what he would do was that he would send the goat out into the wilderness. So what was the significance of the day of atonement? It was very simply this that no one could simply walk in to the presence of God. And do you know why? Because if they did, they would die. So what is the application for all of us this morning? The application really is very, very simple. God of the Bible is a holy God. And he cannot look upon any form of sin or darkness. And because of our rebellion towards God, dear friends, which the Bible calls sin, it has caused a massive barrier between mankind, sinful mankind, that is, and a holy God. And just like we reiterate from the prayer book, 
that important phrase that we don't do so religiously, but it is because we are sinners by nature. And because we are sinners by nature, therefore we sin. And that is why we confess our sins to God every Sunday. We don't do it for the sake of tradition. We do it to remind us of the hope of the gospel that we have in Jesus. How crazy is it to think that we can simply just walk into the presence of God? And think, dear friends, that we can simply treat God any way we want to, or only call upon the Lord when we want Him, or we are in a dire strait or situation in life. And if I click my fingers, God will come to my back and call. To be in the presence of God, dear friends, is life for me. And I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. To remind us that God is a holy God. And how terrifying it is to be in His presence. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. The author very simply writes, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Outside of Christ, our relationship with God is broken. And only Jesus, our great high priest, is able to restore or fix our broken relationship with Him. Between sinful people and a holy God, as is illustrated on the screen behind me in the form of a bridge. Can you see that, friends? Mm -hmm. Or think of Storms River Bridge in the Eastern Cape. For many of you who might have seen the pictures or actually been there, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. But this is between you and me. <laughs> I'm not the greatest fan when it comes to heights. <laughs> but can you imagine that bridge having a crack or was broken. It would be terrifying. And in the same way, just as that bridge is broken, so our relationship with the Lord is broken outside of Jesus. So unlike the Old Testament priests, during the time of the Old Testament, those priests were also human. And because they were human, and we are human like them, that means because of sin, we are going to die. Which is why only Jesus Christ, our eternal high priest, could deal with our problem of sin. And he did so through a sacrificial death upon the cross. So that you and I and all those who believe in Jesus in repentance and faith not only have a relationship with Jesus, but can live and dwell in His presence forever. Our forgiveness friends cost us nothing. Our gift of eternal life is free. With Easter around the world, it was not free for our Lord. It cost our Creator the life of His one and only Son. And may God forgive us for always presuming that it's God's job to forgive us. Don't let us ever, ever fall into that trap, thinking it's God's duty to forgive us. God forgives us for no other reason than because of His great love, mercy, and grace towards us. So what the author is showing us here <coughs> is how the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ was far better and superior than the priesthood 
in the Old Testament. Because Jesus has perfectly paid for our sin. Which is what the Old Covenant could never ever do. What we notice thirdly in our passage this morning is how Jesus' priesthood was effective. The priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ was effective. We see this in verses 20 to 28. How was it effective? The first thing that we notice about Jesus' priesthood being effective was that it was sealed with an oath in verses 20 to 22. The author writes, And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So the fact that Jesus' priesthood was sealed with an oath is to fulfill Psalm 110 verse 4. Showing us, dear friends, that way back in the Old Testament, how Jesus' priesthood was going to be permanent and changeless. God made an oath not because His word is not sufficient enough or that it's not trustworthy enough, but to show us that when God says something, when God speaks, He always acts to fulfill His word. That God is not like us, where we are constantly changing our minds. God never ever changes His mind. And that whatever God says, He is going to do. And He does it by seeing it with an oath. God's Word remains forever. Jesus is the guarantee of that better covenant, which the Old Testament covenant was unable to do. Only Jesus could remove our sins. Because that is exactly what His name means. That Jesus will save us from our sins. So not only was Jesus' priesthood effective in the sense that it was sealed with an oath, but we see secondly that it was permanent and it continues forever. Look with me again at verses 23 to 25. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to say to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Don't you find it exciting, friends, that Jesus is our great final high priest? Do you know what this means? Guess. It's not rocket science. You and I will never ever need another human priest. You don't need the prayers of the pastoral staff. As if you think that somehow the pastoral staff are some kind of mediators between us and God. As a Christian, you can pray. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Amen. You don't need to go through any priest. You don't need to go through any pope. Any bishop. Or any dominion. You don't need to go to the Vatican. You don't need to go to the sacred building of Christ Church Pine Town to pray. You can pray directly to your Heavenly Father through Jesus because He is our great High Priest. And what's more is that as a child of God, did you notice what the author is saying? Jesus is interceding for us. He's not interceding for us at a particular time of day or hour. Jesus is always interceding for us, day by day, hour by hour, as He pours out His grace into our lives. You can at least 
you say waffles. <laughs> one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible. Because when we feel weak, when we feel feeble in our prayer life, when we feel at those times in our prayer life that we feel like we pray to God and our prayers are intimacy and we feel as though God is not answering them, God is answering them because Jesus is interceding on our behalf. And do you know why? Because God's Holy Spirit is living in us. Finally, Jesus' priesthood is effective. Because Jesus' priesthood is not only permanent and forever, but Jesus' priesthood is effective. Do you know why? Because of who he is and what he has done. Look at verses 26 to 28. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, points a son who has been made perfect forever. So friends, we draw our time to a close this morning. Unlike the human priests who had to offer repeated sacrifices, not only for their own sins, but for the sins of the people. Jesus did not have to. Did you see why? Because Jesus is without sin. He is holy. He is perfect. He is separated from sin. Because of who Jesus is, <coughs> all is holiness and perfection. Jesus on that Good Friday offered his life once and for all. The moment that Jesus died, that curtain of the temple was torn <coughs> in two to fulfill the Old Testament. And the moment that barrier was torn down, that curtain was torn in two, was the moment you and I can have a relationship with Jesus, our great high priest, apostle, and king. Jesus did this. Jesus did this. Because God so loved the world, and he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I need to encourage myself as much as you do. Yes, you're all fed up with notion. Let's face it. All of us are worried. <coughs> I need to remind myself on a daily basis. Despite the chaos this world is in, Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our steadfast anchor. <coughs> Jesus is our great high priest. And he wants us to continue in our relationship with him. So that by God's grace, we will never, ever Give up on Jesus, but that we will keep pressing on till the day He calls us home or Christ returns. Let's pray.
Father, the author of Hebrews writes, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. <clears throat> Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And God's people say,